I mean, it'll be landscaped, so the pathway will come past a landscaped area, and then yes, then it, uh, there's a small section that is going to be on the side of the building. Yeah, I, my, my main thing is I, I think we take every opportunity to try and get a, a finished look and feel in our laneways that isn't road concrete. Not, uh, this one yeah. also, as you can see on the plan, there is also a landscape setback that they have provided. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm more thinking about our space rather than their space. I, I'm thinking about... Uh, in Women's we, Lane? Yeah, in Women's Lane, in the area we're taking back, it would be good to have a design concept. Like We talked about this on the other side too, is how do we design these lanes so that it does allow vehicle traffic, but when you're in there, you get the real feeling. It's mm -hmm. a, it, I suppose in, in cycleway strategy, it's a, it's a bike street. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, sorry to interrupt, Ryan, you are correct. We're waiting for the, the design piece to occur from our infrastructure team uh, regarding the laneways and the desired outcomes and to make them more pedestrian friendly. Um, at the planning scheme point of view, what we, what we can do is get that two metres of dedication which, um, which Nadine's done in this instance. Okay, oh, and we're not getting them to construct anything at this stage? In the... In the, um, in the dedication? No. Oh, well, then. No. Okay. I'm fine can with I that then. One, yep. Can I just add one other point while I've interrupted? I do note the recommendation refers to number three as a street address. Is it actually number two? It is number two. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah. Okay. Did you get that, Catherine? Thank you. So I'm going to re refer it to general, mm -hmm. and we might, if you, we're going to have a chat, and we're going to have a talk about what conditions or whatever might be had to mm -hmm. to get to a just a slightly approved sign. That's okay. So do you want us to, to have a look at that, Brian, to, yes, please. to prepare something? Yes, Yep. Okay. So I refer the report? Yes, yeah. Before we go to that, we, any other questions? Oh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. 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 Thank you. I've just got a question then about the entry into the property, if it's going to be through the, the women's lane. What about, like, traffic, if you're coming down there and the left, you know, just before the crossing, if you're turning up there? Which way are you, like thinking people will enter because that's a significant you're coming off the roundabout down past you know where the building is and you're going to turn left there's a crossing there as well how much the hold up of the traffic is it going to be with vehicles turning into women's lane has anyone done a traffic report on that well, um, the planning scheme is encouraging of access and utilizing these laneways for vehicular access so this is actually what we're wanting to achieve to um, provide, to reduce our number of conflict points on Emerald Street. Um, so no, I, I don't believe, well, I'm not aware of us having the council preparing sort of a traffic analysis, but the planning team supports access through the rear and that's what we've been promoting. Uh, the other lots uh, down further from this have all access through the rear. And so your rationale is that you think this will help alleviate congestion? It reduces the conflict points and makes a more pedestrian area along Emerald Street. Yeah. And the planning scheme is requesting that uh, access be taken from the laneways. Mm. Yeah, I could see that can create a congestion point along there, but that's my opinion, yeah. Thank you. Just to follow on from that, the point of that being that the loading and unloading is to be at the rear of the property, not the front of the property. That's Still correct as well. That? Yes, there's a service, uh, there's a service bay provided on site as well. Thank you. And um, just to follow on, is Wimmers Lane one way or two way? Um, it's only facilitators of one way, one way traffic. Actually, I'm not gotcha. sure. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Gotcha. It's, yeah. Imagine trucks, trucks in there. Then, to wonder if trucks in there and pedestrians. Yeah, you can get off the main. main yeah, I think so. Yeah. I yeah. thought the narrowness of it. The, provide one way access only, but yeah. if we can clarify that, that'd be good. It, yeah, that's the sort of thing we that. need yep. to look at in all our laneways. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense that to be one way 
And that would that would that would assist with the traffic issues as well, I mm. would suspect. Well, if you condition the entry from the other end, from Waddle Street, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's where most people access and then from. And make it one way, yeah, or even block off Waddle Street from Maple Street, make that whole pedestrian access up that end. Mm. Yep. Amelia, um, following the dean, thank you for your report. Um, I in terms of condition on the 20 car parking, I note there that one disabled parking space um, is required. Um, sort of just a question, I, I've been talking to residents in Karoi um, and they're um, requesting actually more disabled car parking spaces. Um, does the planning scheme um, prescribe only one? A disabled car spark parking space, or do we have the ability, um, in terms of conditions, to require two disabled car parking spaces? The planning scheme actually only actually identifies um, the number of car parking spaces, so it's a rate of one car parking space per 20 square metres of floor area. The um, Australian standards dictates the requirements for pedestrian, uh, for um, disabled spaces, so it's an Australian standard. So. If we provide a, 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 a um, they're actually um, for a disabled space, or I think they're um, they're not called disabled spaces anymore. They're uh, all access. All access. All yeah. Access. So okay. they're yeah. almost two car parking spaces wide. Mm -hmm. So you have mm -hmm. one car parking space, and then you're required um, an additional, almost an additional car parking oh. space. So uh, they'd be they could provide it. Um, uh, again, as I said, it's an Australian standard. Um, so these guys would have provided as per the Australian standards. So we'd have to, we'd be asking beyond that. Now the planning scheme doesn't detail mm. those requirements. Um, I'd like to discuss that further with you mm -hmm. after the meeting, Nadine. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Thank you. Nadine, following on, I think Amelia is right. I mean, one in five Queenslanders have a disability. Mm -hmm. So that would affect the initial before the safety car parks in this space, but between around 22 car yeah. parks. So, I mean, maybe those, I know, I know we're constrained with the standards we have to adhere to, but it, it might be worth something mm -hmm. looking at. Um, and so there's that. actually a shortage of disabled car yeah. parking spaces in Karoi, so this might be a good opportunity. Um, we did them well where um, the the, car, uh, the hinterland playground. There's a couple. There's some. I mean, I, I mm. present the, the ones that are like there, but they're great. Um, so yeah, it might be an opportunity. Yeah, we'll discuss later. With okay. Yeah, we can have a we can have a look at it. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Following on from that, given that um, what's been what's what's been provided in the uh, in the drawing on the page nine that the upper level could be office or medical centre, and there could be medical uses there. Um, mm. Could the access for disabled people be more uh, uh, more uh, available, given that there's a lift and, uh, for disability compliance to access the second levels or the upper level? So, is that an opportunity that we're, we may be missing to uh, provide an extra disabled parking space? Uh, well, that's as I said. It, if it complies with the Australian standards, that's what the applicant has provided, mm -hmm. and the uh, disabled space is. Um, uh, is close to the lift as well, has easy access mm. to the lift. Um, again, well, we'll be dropping another space. So, um, but it would, I'd have to have a, have a, have, have to have a look into that um, further, yeah. I'll, I'll reframe the question, is there an opportunity there to talk to our staff with regard to the uh, car park in front of, assuming that's all council allocated car park in front, whether there isn't a capacity for an additional yeah. Uh, yes. Disabled parking space out the front of the building. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'll, I'll, that's. Chair, um, just I, I suppose just to comment on the disabled parking. Appreciate the the sentiment in terms of the question about the all access bay or an additional additional bay for this development. I suppose that needs to be looked at. If 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 you're indicating or there's communities indicating there's a shortage of spaces in that particular centre, that's probably something that needs to be looked at at a broader sort of you know in terms of work that's happening in terms of. The, you know, parking for that particular centre and then identifying some key locations where perhaps that access, those access space can be provided. We can certainly have a look at it, but if the applicant's complying with the standard and the planning scheme, we just need to bear that in mind in terms of whether we impose. They might be quite happy to do that, but if they come back and say, look, no, we, we, we've got one space and providing space that we just probably need to negotiate or have further discussions. But if there's 
issues across the centre where there's a... I've already put in some request for that. Right, okay. Yeah, video, yeah. yeah. So that's probably what we need to be, be looking at but at the I broader still level. still want the opportunity to maybe go back to the applicant and ask the question if that's yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank so, you. So the opportunity may be within the place making or planning uh, of the, the centre as a whole in the future to review parking and parking positions and needs. Thank you. Yeah. 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 yeah, thank you. Through the Chair, I think this is a good opportunity then to, you know, widen out the conversation. Uh, I guess Larry's stepping in for the CEO today, so through the, through the Chair, the CEO. Is there opportunity to request back to staff to look at this across the Shire? Um, perhaps in a role of advocacy or changes to strategic planning around looking at um, the Australian standard for all access parking across the Shire. Yeah, Larry. Yeah, look, that's that's, that's all easily possible. We've we've only just recently done a, 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 a you know, car parking study for all of our centres, mm -hmm. so we need to go back and have a look at that, <clears throat> see what it should have identified the various. Um, types of uh, parking available. I, I, off the top of my head, I don't know, but we can go back and look at that. And I agree, it's part of a placemaking exercise. That's what, that's what we should be looking at. Yeah. No question. Um, I think this one is more the, the fact that it, to the chair, this one meets the standards, and that's where we're, that's where we're at right now, it meets the standards. If we impose extra parking just on this particular one, then mm -hmm. you know, they have to meet the standards, which is yeah. 20 yes, car yeah. parks for the size of the, the space, I'm assuming. Uh, 23. And three, and yep. they meet those standards. So if we put an extra car park in, that's going to reduce mm -hmm. that number, essentially, because it's two car parks per disabled park mm -hmm. or access park. Um, so we need to we need to look at that. So it's a, if that's the question that needs to be discussed yeah. and raised, if we want to impose that, but that's that's going to be the the uh, the outset for that or the impact that that will have. But then we can look at a broader one, and that's mm -hmm. a bigger discussion that we need to have. I think. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Oh, I'm all good. Thank you. amongst 
the way we think. And of course, on top of that is the strategic outcome. And when I, I look at this, I think of what what sort of um, places do we want people to live in? And you said, and a question when I was looking at the no, not how to press that that one. And the question on, on page seventeen. There's a uh, diagram of the uh, space, and it appears to me that you have the bathroom on one side and the living area on the other side, and the room is in between. Is that, is that correct? I mean, uh, the, yeah, that's right. So you've got a, um, an entrance door. So one wall of the bedroom is up against the yeah. uh, internal hallway. Then there is a wall that abuts a living kitchen area and that wall has both a door and a window and then the other wall abuts the bathroom and you'll even see um, beside that floor plan you'll see the image of the wall with the door and the window um, and that in our opinion complies with the requirements of PO8 of the sustainable building design code uh, which requires a minimum of two openings per habitable room. Um, council, um, I, I, I take your, your point, Tom, you might not be happy with that, but with the wording um, as it is, we do consider it complies. Um, if, it, if it had said something like contains a minimum of two openings each to a, a, a different wall, then we, we would have been able to look at this one differently. So, uh, um, apologies for my ignorance here, but is this a three bedroom proposal or is it, is it two bedrooms in, in the diagram? This is a, sorry, sorry Tom, this is a two bedroom proposal. It was initially a one bedroom plus a study and the condition required that the study could only be used as such. We're seeking to change, we're agreeing to the applicant's representation to change that condition, to allow the, the room to be used as a bedroom on the basis of its compliance with POA. Okay. Okay. I. I. Sorry. I, I. thought that that little rectangle in the middle was the the room in question, but it's not. That's the the, the sink, I guess. And yeah, it's laundry. laundry. Yeah, laundry. laundry. Okay. Well, laundry. obviously, you see my my concern. Thank you for that. Any yep. Uh, question, Joe. Yeah, just to clarify that, uh, Patrick. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the provision in the original was to be a half wall as opposed to a closed wall. What I see from page seventeen, the indication with the arrow on the window is that it's an opening window. So that creates two openings, a door and a window that can open to the one wall. Is that correct? That is correct, Joe. Thank you. How do you start looking at that? Sean, how do you just look at that? Okay, um, no more questions yet. Um, should we? Um, well, I, I, was, I was hoping you'd go longer. I was going to go and do the hierarchy for you. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> But to, um, to go to the highest point, the strategic intent in the scheme is that different housing types and styles are needed to provide choices, ensuring people's housing needs are catered for, regardless of age and mobility, household sizes and budget. By providing housing choice in each local area, a greater mix of people and ages are accommodated and this can provide a more diverse community. So these small two bedroom ones, are, uh, a variety of, of uses, but the one that probably uh, is under supply is for single parents, um, particularly uh, if there's shared care, that you have uh, one main bedroom where uh, the single parent is, and then you, when you have your children over, you've got another one that can be used for the children or as your office. And so this fits a need. We know there's other places where it occurs uh, that haven't got planning approval for it to occur. So this is fitting that that overarching strategic need of having housing choice. I agree. Mm. Thank you. And don't forget the grandparents when the grandkids come. <laughs> okay, so we, we've moved in a, a seconder uh, for the staff recommendation. I'll put it to a vote. All in favor? That's unanimous. We're off to planning and environment committee meeting agenda number three, RAL 21 slash 0035 slash application to reconfigure a lot. One, one lot into two lots at 21 Jerima Crescent Kariba. We have Patrick Murphy to help us through this. So, you know, mute, Patrick. 
It never made so much sense. <laughs> yeah, the best I've ever made. Thank you. Um, sorry for that. Um, as you said, this is a rural residential lot in Coroiba, which the applicant is seeking to reconfigure from one into two lots. Um, the lot is constrained by flooding. Uh, the bushfire overlay has riparian buffer and, and uh, vegetation protection in accordance with the biodiversity overlay code. Um, the applicant has provided a site for the house, which is outside the probable maximum flood. However, they've not demonstrated that access to the site um, is suitable uh, in context of potential flood risk. Um, also, um, there's been some discussions with the applicant with regards to what the extent of uh, ecological protection should be on the site through, the, through a covenant. Um, council officers have sought for that to reflect the covenant which was required on the adjoining allotment, which you may recall was one that was originally re refused, but uh, an, a, an outcome was negotiated uh, on appeal. So as I said, we've sought that the covenant on this site um, and the vegetation protection reflect what was on the adjoining site. The applicant hasn't agreed to that. They're just seeking for uh, 10 metres either side of the waterway to just naturally regenerate. Um, and because we're not in agreement on, on that issue, it's our position that, the, uh, that there should be a broader covenant, but that also brings into light the impact of that greater vegetated area in terms of bushfire risk and the suitability of that house site in relation to the bushfire risk. So we've got a number of issues that we feel that haven't been adequately addressed and resolved by the information provided by the applicant. Um, and therefore, we are recommending that this application be, be refused. Thank you, Patrick. Questions? Starting with, well, we'll start with Joe. Yeah, yeah, Good. Yeah. Still raise his hand, but Brian, you probably have a couple of questions. Ma, I'm just getting my thoughts together at the moment. Sorry for my yeah, yeah. yeah. Just with regard to the proposed covenant, Tom, uh, the applicants re uh, requesting 10 metres of, uh, of revegetated buffer. What's the proposal from staff in the covenant as to uh, what the buffer, the riparian buffer, should be? Well, we as I said, to reflect the covenant on the adjoining allotment, which was 10 metres to the eastern side of the waterway, and then the remaining extent of the riparian buffer on the western side. Which is how wide? Uh, I'd have to measure that for you. Unfortunately, I'm in front of a computer if you're happy to, to does, wait. Does, uh, 70, does 75 metres sound correct? It would be likely to be in the order of that distance, that's correct. The question raised by the, the applicant when I spoke to him yesterday was, in creating a 75 metre buffer, are we actually creating a bushfire hazard by revegetating to that extent? Well, that's, that's part of the question that we're asking, Joe, that, um, we, we consider that the ecological outcomes are, are very important on this site and throughout the Shire, and certainly the scheme is pointing us that way. Um, so seeking the revegetation in accordance with the scheme, it does require the proposed house site to be, um, you know, some sites to go into the, whether that is suitable in terms of bushfire risk, and the applicant hasn't gone there. We don't know at this point. I'll ask it in a different way. If we had a house, uh, if we had a house on a lot, what are they allowed to create in the way of a buffer around the property to avoid uh, bushfire risk? Uh, the, the, the exemptions for bushfire relate to necessary clearing. Um, so that will often be determined by a, uh, a bushfire consultant who will look at the materials of the house and the, and the risk of the bushfire in terms of the vegetation type, the slope, um, the aspect of the vegetation in terms of the house and determine what should be an area that is suitable to be cleared around the house so that you know could relate to different bell levels. Um, but there's also an allowance in the scheme for um, one and a half times the height of the nearest vegetation 
so a buffer uh, to that area but it has to be necessary clearing it has to um, be for the purpose and only for the bush for the purpose for bushfire protection so the the difference here in creating a house site and having to revegetate re re a riparian buffer is that the house site may not be sufficient for a house to exist without a bushfire risk is that is that the that is that is correct okay Patrick, can I just, um, the, we all got some information from the applicant um, and there was a report prepared by Equilibrium Ecology. Are you aware okay, of that yep. report? Yep, I'm familiar with the report. Okay, so they, they say something a bit different. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you've actually had the opportunity to, I guess, go over that report and make, make some comment because that re yeah. My apologies, sorry. No, no, please continue, sorry. Is it, the report's certainly been reviewed by our environment officer, um, but I think the, the, the issue at play here is that we're, we're, not, we're not in agreement with the extent of the, um, the suitability of the revegetation in that uh, rock area buffer area. So just, just to Joe's point though, it says it demonstrates that people and property will remain safe in the event of a bush fire. The, these matters can all be conditioned. Well, the, the report is based on a 10 metre wide um, natural regeneration, uh, 10 metres each side of the waterway, which is less than the extent of um, vegetation uh, enhancement that we're seeking in accordance with the scheme requirements. So the report is, um, it's not consistent or it's, it, it doesn't address the potential uh, extent of vegetation which the scheme requires. Okay, so, so potentially the, the, the report, um, so there's two different things then. What you're saying is the report says that, sorry, you're probably having trouble hearing me. The report says it, it doesn't meet those ecological values, but then, uh, but potentially then if we take away the, but it does then address the bushfire is, is that what we're saying? Well, if we were to accept that 10 metres each side of the waterway was sufficient uh, in terms of the ecological outcomes, yeah. then the report would be talking to that and has demonstrated that the risk um, from that extent of uh, vegetation enhancement is suitable, uh, seeking a 60 metre buffer. So. I, okay, okay. So we, we don't consider it that is acceptable in terms of the extent of uh, ecological enhancement and therefore it's something that can't be conditioned because we don't know whether it can be achieved. <coughs> I think I've got a thoughts together on this one. <coughs> so the, the next door block was subject um, to a, a heated, uh, a very well informed debate. Um, <laughs> the, the difficulty we've got in this side is um, upstream is quite good quality, what I think is a chain of fill wetland system, which our, our planning scheme has, has indicated they think it's a waterway. I think that's only since European settlement that it's become a waterway, just because of the nature of the landscape. The difference between this one and the one next door is immediately adjacent to this one is some um, ecosystems, matters of state environmental significance. So it is desirable to extend um, that rehabilitation into it. Now, the, the scheme adopts 100 metres. Um, that's based on providing a, trying to get these areas to be corridors for a range of wildlife not just the aquatic habitats so from an aquatic rehabilitation perspective you don't need a hundred meters to achieve the ecosystem outcome the uh, one of the things I argued next door was there's actually more value considering the level of degradation because a lot this waterway is extensively damned so you won't have a lot of natural values um, uh, except when, when you've got water flowing over the top, so you get connectivity that way. But the back of the block is a koala habitat, it's remnant vegetation, 
and to me there is opportunity to to refine what we want in the riparian corridor to narrow it from that the 75 to, to still achieve a ecological improvement but do the trade-off of saying what we're not requiring there we, we want you to try and if you look at the site if you bring up the map Kathy um, so we can see the back how it's a sort of a triangular in the agenda yeah Yeah, so you see the area, oh no, go down, yeah, just, see the area that's... I'll just share it from Patrick. Oh, okay. You can see the area at the rear, I think that's flood mapping they've got shown in the, the or is that the, I'm not sure what the purple is, I think it is the flood mapping. The, the area to the rear of the block, uh, if you've got these two blocks being red vegetated up there, um, you're actually building on a, a larger remnant piece. So you actually, you know, it's better conservation value by getting your larger tracks to be bigger. Um, and that's what, at the, you know, actually transferring some of that rehab to the back of the block rather than to the creek would work. And then, to me, I'm happy with trying to go away and find an outcome if there is any flexibility in the applicant to, in that regard. And then we just have to think about the flood prone access. And I suppose that would, I suppose the key question is it can't be any worse than next door. That we only just approved. Next door is different, Brian, because the um, the house sites to the front of the lot. Oh, have you, is the, the is negotiated settlement having a house at the front of that creek now? Is it? Yes. yes. Well, oh, okay. because yes, because all to the rear of that site. If you look on um, in the report, uh, just there's a. The on page thirty one of the report, it it details that covenant that was agreed for next door. Okay. And that's you know obviously informing our thinking. And when you talk about linkage, we're also seeking linkage into that covenant on the on the common boundary. Okay. But as you'll see, there's a building of light to the front of that site, so there are some differences. So that was yeah, sorry, that, that was that's different to how they start their original yeah. approval because they originally had their their um, house on the black on that one. We obviously negotiated during the mediation process to have it up front. Yep. Okay. So that makes sense. So okay. Sorry, Patrick. In relation to that block next door, where does the where does the house lot sit in relation to the covenant? It's. it's uh, so the adjoining property. Yeah. yeah. See number yeah, eleven. You'll see the hatch the hatched area on page thirty one. So the yellow area is the covenant and sort of to the right of the number 11 on, on that mm. is the building envelope. Okay, so it's gone, it has gone completely to the front of the property? Yeah. Okay, all right. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, And if you had a similar level of revegetation to that, then then you would have definitely would have bushfire issues on the nominated house side here. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. so it's yeah. something to think about, isn't it? So is that an outcome that could be achieved on this property as well? If it, if the applicant was willing to look at subdividing at the front in two halves rather than at the rear of the property, or has that not been discussed with the applicant? Uh, I'm just having a look at because I think the extent of flooding. If you go to uh, if you go to page 27, um, the front of the site is significantly constrained by flooding. So where the house site is at the moment is out of the flood area. Um, so if, again, if you go to page 27, you'll see that the PMF mapping on that page, um, which would also line up with the, the flood hazard overlay. Um, yeah. Okay. So the, 
opportunity's not there, Joe. That's all right. All right. Would somebody like to move it? To Referred to General for further consideration. Councillors, this report is basically doing two things. It's making you aware of the fact that we're entering into negotiations with transport and main roads. We're seeking receiving sites to um, offset vegetation losses as a necessary result of their infrastructure projects. So just, and the second thing we're doing is making you aware that we're developing a more developing an offset environmental offset policy, which we'll be reporting to you in a future council round once we've gone through internal consultation. So. So how this, how this basically came to light is about six months ago we started to talk to Transport and Main Roads about the proposed Six Mile Creek bridge replacement project because we actually, before that stage we weren't consulted so we made aware of it so they sent us the Oricon report which I sent you as an attachment. Mm -hmm. We spoke to them about a number of issues we had with that. We were able to resolve those issues as much as we can bearing in mind that we're not really assessing the, the application has been referred to the state and the Commonwealth for assessment under National, matters of national environment significance and state environment significance. So we don't actually have any assessment role, we're just basically in the server role. But um, as a result of those conversations, they advise us actually seeking receiving sites to offset, offset vegetation loss from the infrastructure projects. And we suggested we may be able to accommodate that, bearing in mind that currently all those receiving sites are not being offset in Noosa Shire, they're going to Sunshine Coast Council and elsewhere, so we're actually getting a net loss of biodiversity out of the Shire. So I guess it represents a bit of an opportunity for us. For the, I mean, offsets are, they're not perfect. You know, they're, they're, you can't replace a remnant forest with things sitting in tree guards. It takes a long, long time. It's, it's got a lot of failings, but it's better than nothing. And the, the second part about it is, as you see in the report, could have some significant financial benefits for our community in terms of job creation. For our hinterland economy, so that's that's pretty much where I'm coming from. In a lot of ways, with the, with the financial benefits. Mm -hmm. um, question with the financial benefits, um, you know, if you say it's twenty thousand dollars per year, which over the next few years may be one point two million dollars over um, coming into the Noosa Shire. That that's a pretty significant amount of money. Well, it is. That that mostly goes to labor and land care for. for Growing and planting the trees. Correct, right? yeah. People got nurseries, you know, sort of bush regeneration companies like Noosa Land Care or some of the other local companies. So it's going into our local economy potentially. I mean, it could be more than $20,000 a hectare. We're just still having those negotiations with TMR. So, so it basically, it's getting, we've, we've had about three or four meetings with them. So this, this report is basically to, to get basically whether you want us to proceed with that or. or from philosophical grounds, we don't want to have a bar of it, so it's entirely up to you, really, if you want to keep going. I think it's beneficial myself, but... Any questions? Take questions, yeah, I put an email. Am I right the Oricon report isn't correct that they listed the Mary of Akkad as yeah. well when it's in danger? Yeah, the Oricon report had a number of inconsistencies in it, and that's one of them. Yeah. Um, am I right that we should be replacing the... Um, the lowland low 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 forest in the Six Mile Creek because it's actually quite habitat. Yeah, correct. Now the trouble we've got is most of Six Mile Creek, Creek is mapped as remnant already. So that we can't, So again, you've got to look at council reserves that are on the Six Mile Creek. We actually haven't got any. We have got one in the in the, the Mary Catchment on Karoi Creek up near Beyong Drive, Beyong Drive Environmental Reserve off Long Water. No, so we're not, we're not actually, we're, um, we're not, the report doesn't re require them to actually offset Mary River Cod, so it's... it's, it's no, no, I mean the, the yellow belly hole, sorry. It's all mapped as remnant, mate. Is it? Yeah. You did such a good job 20 years ago. <laughs> that's it. Okay. Yeah, I, that's one of my, like, I think, I'm not sure if it's a scheme or the environment strategy, we embedded the principles of the mitigation hierarchy in it, which basically says you, you protect you rehabilitate, and you know, when all else fails, you offset. So I think we, you know, it makes sense to have an offset policy. I'm just strongly of the view that 
uh, if you're dealing with endangered species habitat, you have to replace like with like in habitat now. That might be that you do have to go outside the Shire to replace the cod habitat because it is known habitat. We've um, previously <laughs> spent money removing a a um, uh, unapproved footpath through that set reach of creek to, to allow biopassage to go through. Um, and yeah, so to me, that's just one of the elements you would do is you'd be saying, you know, all possible, like for like, looking at all the habitats, not just the tree species, and I'd hate for anything to go out of the, the Mare River into the Rotten Noose River systems. See if we can get enough. But the, the, stuff you, the, the site you mentioned doesn't have the same river systems. Yeah. So the, the site down at um, Caluthan, uh, that's a different ecosystem, uh, does have some koala values, but yeah. So that, that's only my, and you're not asking us to commit to anything. I just think that's mm. the things we need to consider. Yeah, Dave, what are the opportunities here? Uh, I mean, we're talking about offsets, offset plantings, but for rehabilitation of degraded sites as an offset project, is there an opportunity here within an offset policy to facilitate more than just an offset planting and actually sort of along the lines of what Brian's saying and even more than that to, to look at a, a degraded site where it's uh, prolific with weed species in particular and look at the cost of removal of those weed species and then rehabilitate the site? Definitely, definitely, Council. That's going to be part of the process. In fact, what we're proposing with the Caluthan Nature Refuge, where the 60 hectares is, is actually regrowth. It's the old Joe Franz property, which 10 years ago was basically grazing land. Mm -hmm. So it's now regrowing to very much thick melaleuca. It needs koala food trees planted in there. So it's very much along the lines of what you're talking about. I'm thinking about um, some of the council reserves maybe a bit closer to urban areas as well that uh, suffer the consequences of either um, garden escapees that need uh, need some uh, more time and attention devoted to them to remove those uh, those garden escapees, or um, a site in Butler Street that has a significant number of slash pines and and um, uh, you know probably not prolific, probably not category one weed species, but a significantly degraded site as a result of um, camp laurels and you know lots of areas where we have camp laurels and things like that that probably aren't at the high grade of weed, uh, uh, weeding, uh, weed species that need to be attended to, but lower grade species, but still significantly impacting on the, uh, the native nature of, uh, of the reserve. Yes, I think so, Council. It comes down to two factors, long-term viability of urban bushland reserves, and the second thing is um, the protective status. Under the offset requirements, we have to actually put a protective mechanism over the, over the property, whether it's a nature refuge like we've got with our count larger council blocks, or a voluntary declaration under the Vegetation Management Act, but it is all definitely possible. Thank you. Um, yeah, fit the koalas with hide his vest. Uh, I'm just thinking in terms of your discussions, and we've got to understand the um, Caluthan side, we've also got a fair chunk of money sitting in there from a previous agreement on offsets for koala habitat. Would it be worth looking at that Six Mile Creek catchment and saying, have we got some blocks there that are completely flood prone that we should be buying and using uh, the environment levy, to then using the, the offset money to revegetate? I think that's where we should be heading in this thinking is not just look where we're currently in, but can this provide us an income stream to you know, make the linkages uh, along creek systems, etc. Yes, I agree with that. The environment levy policy doesn't really address, address purchasing cleared land. It just talks about purchasing environmentally significant land, mm. which um, but I, I agree entirely. Yeah, it's, well, it's always environmentally significant, it's significant it's long six mile creek. Yeah, it's a floodplain, yeah, yeah. Actually, we looked at a property there a couple of weeks ago at um, Graham's Road for that exact purpose, yeah. yeah. So. Millie, do you have a question? Oh, I do. Um, I'm interested in the Rotten Noose River and the Environment Offset Policy and Associated Guideline. Can you talk to that, please? Have we a, an environment offset policy, or is this um, a noting that we are to embark on putting together a policy? Because I can't find an offset policy in council. No, there, there actually isn't one. That's the problem. Uh, up to now, it's been very much an ad hoc approach and bear in mind that Noosa Council probably had some of the first offsets from Queensland when it wanted to expand the, the Noosa Umundi landfill back in 2005 and they had to offset clearing of endangered regional ecosystems so all that land was offset 
around Lake Macdonald, which was then owned by council. So that offset's still going. That was probably one of the first offsets in Queensland. So, but there was never any policy. You know, since that, we have got a tree management on public land policy, which is owned by the infrastructure services team. But basically, what our policy will be saying is th these are the requirements when we need to under council jobs where we need to offset vegetation removed, and these are, and these are the these are the governance procedures we'll have in place when we need to revegetate. Exactly what I'm talking about now, have the receiving sites. Will it also include um, opportunity for community to review survey monitoring um, or mapping of offset sites? We've just got a lot of very knowledgeable people in yeah. the community that I think can provide a lot of input in this space. Um, well, we're actually, policy yeah, we're actually, we're actually going to be running the, um, the offset policy Post Dr. Jan Green, who's um, okay, at Nike, yeah. yeah. So we are actually are doing that because you've got a lot of experience in that space, Councillor. Fantastic. And there's someone also that I've connected with, Rebecca, who's um, got a doctorate in all this and has been working um, with environment um, on ecological assessment reports and Thank checklists. You. And yeah. that would be great to incorporate her work or touch base with her in this policy, um, Dave. So I'm excited. Yeah, very good. I'll just, just add one of the things the offset policy won't be doing is talking about state or federal government referrals because the state and federal Commonwealth government have their own offset policy so anything that in involves clearing vegetation that's affected by the state or Commonwealth legislation gets referred to them so we don't, exactly like this TMR report you saw, we, we can't actually influence that rather than just refer it to the appropriate authority for, and, and for assessment. And last question, in terms of um the glossies. Um, my understanding, August 12th this year, the Australian Minister for Environment and Water listed the Southern East Glossy Black Cockatoo as vulnerable under the National Environment Law. Does that mean it's now listed as endangered or it's just been identified and has, um, and should we be aware of this listing? Well, that's the Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act. It's now listed as vulnerable under the state, under the Nature Conservation Act. It's also listed as vulnerable. That's my understanding. So, uh, was which it species we're talking about? Are you talking about the glossy black cockatoo or the southern species? Um, I'm talking about the glossies, but here says the southeastern glossy black cockatoo. Yeah. No, I'd have to. I'm sorry, I have to take that on notice and get back to you on that. The, it, it has been gone through the process of consultation on raising it to endangered. Yeah, so it's, it hasn't been. Listed. But I haven't seen anything come through that that decision's been made. Yeah, with regard to an offset policy, if we're going to that uh, to, to that extent, um, if, for example, a rehabilitation site was across the road to add connectivity and there was a road involved, could uh, the policy include things along the lines of um, rope bridges and that for uh, facilitating wildlife moving across a roadway, for example? I, I believe so, yes. That'd be good, thank you. Yes. I just have a question then. So, um, with regard to the offset policy, is there opportunity then for, you know, when we're talking about the destination management plan and, you know, people coming here and value adding, we talked yesterday about in the DMP about values of people who visit and people who live here. Will the offset policy provide opportunity where we're regenerating blocks that, you know, people travelling here could invest by, I don't know, planning out certain areas and then, I don't know, earning points back for carbon offset or whatever's a contribution to our shire? Have um, you considered that? Or would that be covered in this policy? The policy basically covers the circumstance where a person who's got to develop, do a development that's going to revolve, involve clearing vegetation has to pay to, to make sure they're not creating any biodiversity loss. So there's actually a financial arrangement. They actually pay their way to, to damage that vegetation by paying us money mm. to actually rehabilitate that vegetation. A third party probably shouldn't have a, a role in that because oh, okay. it's, it's almost like a, it's a, it's a legal requirement of that proponent to actually pay money to offset that vegetation. Mm. Um, can I add that I think Tourism Noosa Juanita Bluefield's working in this space. So Lady Elliot um, have opportunities for visitors um, to come and help revegetate ecological spaces um, and they're actually working and apparently it's hard work and in return for their hard work they're contributing to, you know, regenerating this beautiful space 
and they get a holiday out of it. Um, and it's something that Juanita is actually in the space doing the same sort of thing in New South Korea. That's good, yeah. We've yeah. got a lot of other council properties where we can actually probably do that. And the people who Mr. Landcare does that with some of the Euro rental planning stuff mm -hmm. had visitors, you know, taking part in community tree planting days as well. Fantastic. Yeah, the Australian Trust for Conservation Volunteers used to quite often come and do weed control in National Park and they used to stay down the Scaffrey and quite often they were they were backpackers or whatever it's part of their part of their holiday. Yeah. Um, Any more questions? I'm I'm happy to move it. Second. Yeah, and I, I I did I did raise the mitigation hierarchy, and I'm sure everyone knows. But I think it's really important when we look at offsets that the, the number one thing we try and do is avoid the clearing. In this case, it's obviously a, a high priority road corridor that has flooding impacts, and it's a overall community benefit to clear the trees. And that's yeah. You then minimise it, which obviously they are, are required to do in this case because they've got endangered, or what they call it, critically endangered lowland rainforest, which coincidentally don't even, doesn't even trigger a, a, um, the same level in the Queensland Vegetation Management Act because there's more than 30% of it left. Um, so then you minimise and then you restore and then the final in the hierarchy is you offset yeah. to try and make sure that your, your, you know, your impacts are minimised. So that's what we should be doing. Thank you. Right. Uh, Thank you. All in favour, unanimous. Thank you. 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 Thank um, I'll cancel the Stuart and form a meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter in relation to the application by Alton Properties Number 9, PL, PTE, which is listed as item 18 in this report. I have a friendship with Rob McCready or associated with the applicant. As a result of my conflict of interest, I'll acknowledge the meeting room on the matter is considered a vote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Mayor Stewart has left the room. Who's next? Uh, Councillor Finzel. I, Councillor Finzel, inform the meeting that I have a terrible conflict of interest in this matter in relation to the application by Alton Properties, number 9 PLTTE, which is listed as item 18 in this report. Lee McCready, who is associated with the applicant, was involved in a volunteer capacity for my 2020 election campaign with Future Noosa, which is no longer an entity. As a result of my conflict of interest, I will now leave the meeting room while the matter is considered and voted on. Third time lucky. I wish to inform the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter in relation to the application by Ultimate Properties number 9, PLTTE, which is listed as item 18 on this report. On 24th February 2020, I sought a review by the Independent Council Election Observer as to the public claims of the Future News team, of which Lee McCready was publicly identified as a campaign manager. Lee McCready is associated with the applicant. Although I have a declarable conflict of interest, I do not believe a reasonable person could have a perception of bias because the Council's consideration of this application is not to approve or reject it, it is only for noting of a decision that has already been made by staff. Therefore, I will choose to remain in the meeting room. However, I'll respect the decision of all the other people in the meeting on whether I can remain and participate in the decision. We, this is a monthly occurrence. I. I note that it's called a conflict of interest by Councillor Stockwell and determined that it is in the public interest that Councillor Stockwell participates and votes on this matter because the Council believes that a reasonable person could not have a perception of bias because the ICEO review was, inv was advisory service, not statutory process, <coughs> and Councillor Stockwell's queries at that time were the public interest and neither he nor Mr. Creedy could be personally gain or lose from that advice and therefore a reasonable person would trust that the final decision is made in the public interest. Um, so is it before you do, oh, yes. 
I, I have a procedural question as the acting CEO. <laughs> um, considering the ability to continue the meeting despite a quorum, does it override the need within the standing orders to have a second for a motion? No, I wouldn't think so because of the, of the numbers. So I think if, as the chair, you've got the right to, I don't have to check the standing orders, but my understanding is you have the right as the chair to, to, to override that, to make that decision. I don't know. I don't know. Well, to be, to be careful, I, I think we should say the motion. Um, uh, lapses for want of a seconder, but then it's a procedural motion. You can make them and refer to general committee. Yeah. Okay, so that's what I'll do. Then I'll refer this to general. Well, committee. I think that's I think that's the right course anyway, yeah. given the numbers. But it is these these matters have already been decided. So this is a, this is a report for noting. So if you take it through the general, it can be noted by the by the full group. Yeah, uh, I think that's that's fine to do that. I just needed to find something to ask you that was difficult. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's not wrong. That's very perceptive because, you know, you can't have one person, you know, really leading the charge and making the decision for this to go, you know, to, to not go to general, to not be voted on by, by a forum. Yeah. It will be voted on by a forum once. Once Brian it goes to, once to go to general. No. Oh, no, once they come back to the No, Brian's no. staying in the room. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I just never thought of it when, because I saw the NA up there. I've never thought of it before that, about the lack of a second. It has been. No, no, I'm just saying I don't think it's right. Uh, I think we've been in this position before and voted upon it. Um, and I don't think it needs to go to general. I think previously where we got to was I could stay and just make it a procedural motion. This is a yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm, I'm comfortable either way. I just, it was just when I saw NA, I thought, hmm. So, the issue is my, my vote to, 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 to um, have Brian stay in the room, and, yep. and, and I can do that as, as the sole person. We don't need two people to do that, that's what Brian would have. That's minus and then when Brian oh, in the room, yeah, we'll then we can, yeah. um, and we'll work it out later. Then, we, then there's two of us, a yeah. first and a secondary, and we could um, approve the, the yeah. notice after the report. Yeah. And, and again, this is a report for noting. It's not, you're not yeah. making a decision. Yeah. 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 It's it's not, no one's going to complain about it. it. No. So but if we, we might just need to look at it from a yeah. A future point of view. There is a quorum. I think this is good. Yeah. There will be a quorum for the decision yeah. on the report. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. the Act talks about that you don't have to have a quorum. Um, yeah. But the, um, yeah, I never thought about that being not having a second. Yeah. Yeah. Might have to just clarify that if we're going to review the standing orders. Yeah, I think that's in the, in the review of the standing orders and the, and the layout of the, the ride of the, of the process, I think that's what we for now, if this is the process we've done before, yeah. I think we can go forward. And given that it is a, a um, for noting, if this was a decision making, then I would say let's refer to, to Joe Taylor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, we're ready to say anything else? Councillors Balfour remains in the room. Yeah. And we can vote on the paper of voting. Hang on. Oh, that, okay. Before you do that, I, I have a question about. The item oh, 20. right, right, right. Um, you mentioned Blue Care Operational Works, um, Block 9, the one grass tree yep. court. What's, um, what's involved there, Patrick? What's, what, what's the approval action? Um, it, it's for landscaping associated with uh, the roadworks. Um, so there's a uh, it's around, it's sort of around just the perimeter of the road, so down to the uh, around the cul de sac head along each side of that sort of street planting, um, Frank, and also out towards David Low Way where the road's being realigned as well. Okay. Some landscaping in that area. So, nothing on lot nine, it's, it's just associated no. with that. <clears throat> yeah. That's correct. Okay. And does that does the street planting feature allocatories? Um, I, I, I'd have to bring up the decision notice, Brian, but I, I do recall the officer at the time um, seeking for uh, the food trees to be included in the street planning. I might have to come back to you on that to yeah, be no, definitive. Just, yeah. just, a, just an email's fine. It just we did move a motion to try and encourage it. Yeah, yeah no, I, as I said, I do recall this coming up with the officer at the time that was looking at it. 
but I'll, I'll send you an email. Thank you. Yeah. The other, I'll send you an email. The other question I have, um, just um, a technical question. Patrick um, or, or Leo, a lot of these applications, for example, for dwelling houses, in in brackets they have, setbacks, length of wall, roof, pitch eaves, height, uh, boundary setbacks, does that mean the relaxations have been granted in those instances? Um, I've actually picked up on another one. I was looking at all this before and saw that there was a caretaker's unit included on one in an industrial area. And it, it, I just was curious and I had a look at it and I know that the caretaker's dwelling was um, removed from the application during the process as a response to the information request from the officer. Yes. So I've got a, it leads me to believe that what this is pulling in is actually what was applied for. Um, it, 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 it's likely that um, those variations may have been approved, but um, I think it's something we, we might have to have a look at, Leo, yeah. in terms of the, the yeah, reporting specific. and to see um, what we can do to make sure that what's coming through actually reflects what's been approved and not what's been applied for. Yeah. So, for example, on page 48 or page 9 of 10 of the, the report, application 27, a dwelling house, and then in brackets it's got height, fence height and setbacks. Um, just so I understand what you're saying, Patrick, does that mean that relaxations in height, fence height and boundary setbacks have been granted in that instance? It definitely means they were applied for. Um, with, without knowing what was actually approved on that one, um, I'd be guessing, but I'd say it's likely that those, those were all approved. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just make a comment then. Um, relaxations granted in, on dwelling houses in residential areas is a source of huge concern and complaint for a lot of residents, the affected residents. And mm. for these to be going through at a delegated authority level um, has the potential to create a lot of retrospective headaches um, and heartache. I'm just wondering if there are any applications requesting significant setbacks in height or boundary setbacks. Uh, can we be given a heads up about that? Um, or is there any way if they could be triggered to come before council? Uh, well, everything that's going to come to us is going to be seeking a variation. So there's a lot of houses that are built in Noosa that might go through to a certifier. So you're only seeing the ones where they're seeking a, a variation. Um, in terms of bringing them through to council, um, we are a, for the ones, the item that you referred to, number 27, that's a wrap where council is a referral agency. Yes. So we are, we do have time frames. Um, a wrap does not go deemed approval, but uh, the additional time frame to get a matter to council um, really would elongate that assessment process, the time frame. Yeah. And I don't know whether that would be considered to be to be reasonable from an applicant's perspective. Yes. Um, and also noting the significant workload that that would add to officers. Um, yeah. The. So we've, we've had reports come to council before about um, applications to extend dwellings um, that they, you know, involving uh, the, design, the redesigns have involved um, incursions into boundary setbacks and, and height, um, exceeding height limits. What's the difference here? I, I, I get a certifiers are involved, but some things, some things come before council regarding just dwelling houses, dwellings involving boundary setbacks and height relaxations. They're usually refused by council. Um, no, those matters might have gone before council at the request of an applicant. Um, I'm not too familiar with too many houses coming before council in my time here. Uh, I know that we've got the ones on Seaview Terrace at the moment because of the issues um, with uh, coastal processes and, and, and geotechnical issues that they've been going before council and um, that was through negotiation with the applicants. Yeah. Um, there was one at Perugian, Patrick, in Kingfisher recently, I think it was a, a duplex, uh, came, came 
came to us. Mm. And uh, I guess the, the one above that, uh, number 26, is 33 Seaview Terrace, Sunshine Beach. Dwelling house, it's got height and setback. Um, I, I imagine relaxation is applied for and therefore granted. How is that different to the house at, say, 66, where there are similar um, contentious elements that came before the full council? Um, I, I dare say that 33 Seaview Terrace um, may not have a coastal building line. Yeah. And, and um, being num an odd number, actually, it would be on the non um, coastal side, foreshore side of the road. Yeah. So the ones that I've got it is number 66, CV Terrace, so that's certainly on the beach side, being a, an even number. So I'd say that that's the reason why that one hasn't had those same issues. Sure. So um, go back to application 27, number 27, fence height relaxation. Is there a standard height fences are meant to be in the show? Because I get a few questions about this. Is it one uh, eight metres? Um, if it's up to two metres. Up to two metres. Um, for, for a front fence. Yep. Now, you're talking Hilton Terrace, so you're talking areas for a new dwelling that are going to have to be filled. Yep. And then that, that, that creates the associated issues with the yeah. Um, the height and the fence heights. The setbacks is the consequence of those lots being quite narrow. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of those lots in that area can be quite narrow, so... Um, yeah, so you also start taking into account impact on the street front, so they're not going to be approving something that is overly high or likely to have a negative impact on the street front. That's right, we'd be looking for the building to be sufficiently set back, uh, for it to be articulated. Uh, and then if there was a height variation, then I'd say it, it, it may relate to you know, a, a pitch of the roof. Yeah. But again, with the extent of filling that is required along Hilton Terrace, it does give rise to um, many of the dwellings seeking some level of height variation. Okay, no, thank you. Thank you, uh, Frank. Those are really good questions, and I think that's the best one. I'm learning as well. Yes, and you know, when, when do they come before council? Uh, Amelia. Um, so maybe um, a workshop, Leo, so that we understand if, if it's code accessible, um, the reasons why they're approved, not approved, um, maybe just a follow-up of today's conversation. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking... As part of that conversation, maybe Patrick and I and a couple of others could go back and just sit down and go through some of those examples mm -hmm. and perhaps, you know, take, take on that feedback that, yeah. that's been dis discussed today and then come back and say, yeah, this is what was applied for, what was approved, and, and we can just work through that with the councillors. Yeah. Yeah, if you're happy with that. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Looking at 33 Sea View, it looks like it was a, a covered awning going to the side boundary. It looks new on the image. Yep. Um, one last question. Well, any other questions? That um, eighty-three Butler Street, number twenty-five, on page um, forty-eight. Patrick, is that is that part of the old the aged care there? Is that is that that property that's being cut up? Um, I'm just going to bring it up if you don't mind. Eighty-three Butler Street. No, it's um. It was just one lot. It was just one residential lot with a house on it. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yeah. yeah. No. So that, that there is a big aged care. We forget what it's named, right? Next yeah, that's on McKinnon Drive. That's on McKinnon Drive. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You're yes. You're referring to the one that hasn't been developed. Yeah. No, that's it's not that lot. It. it it's um, some distance from that, 100 metres or so, and it, as it's, it's, it's just a large residential lot. Yeah. yeah. I used to buy hay there in the 80s. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Great. Thank, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, number 28 on page 
49 has just triggered something. It mentions, set, um, in terms of relaxation, setbacks, side cover, roof pitch, eaves, and front fence. Uh, a resident of Sunshine Beach recently pointed out to me a neighbouring house which looked, effectively looked like a, a, a large white concrete box. No eaves, um, no roof pitch, a large concrete box and rightfully questioned what's happened to the Noosa style of housing design. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if this workshop we're going to be having about relaxations granted uh, have some regard to um, the new sub subtropical design that we're, we're aspiring to encourage. So uh, these relaxations have that in mind. Yeah, so in response to... Just, just for your information, Frank, the new scheme has removed the requirement for roof pitch and eaves through areas of the Shire. Yes, okay. The, the coastal communities and um, I believe the uh, Noosa, Noosa Heads area. Um, so it, it does change the allowable design outcomes when there's no roof or... Uh, ease requirement at all. Thank you for that. So that, that's not an assessment de determination, it's not an officer supporting that. Yeah. It's a it's being constructed scheme. in compliance with the scheme. Yes, that's right. We had that Thank conversation you. with people. Yeah, I remember. People were building, uh, they put the roof pitch and then they just put a box around it because for some reason architects that think boxy houses look good. It'll be date very soon. Anyway. Oh, that's <laughs> no, no, that's a, so probably just to further add to that, so I'd be working with um, Rebecca, we're just looking at putting together a bit of a parameter in terms of that review going forward, so I'll be meeting with Rebecca in the next week or two yeah. uh, just to discuss that and get that moving along, progressing as we've discussed previously. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Okay, Do we vote on it, but do we call it an approval or do we... Yes, no. Just no. Have we done that yet? No. no. I'll second your motion. Okay. Okay, all in favour? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, we had a really interesting conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're on to item six, polystyrene round table. And we have... Melissa. Melissa. Oh. Hi, Melissa. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Briefing. Okay. Um, so, basically... We had our round table and most of the people here actually attended, which was very successful, I felt. Um, we got a really, really good range of recommendations from the round table. Um, we pulled together information from a, a few people in the room, plus also the recordings and things like that. So we pulled together the recommendations. Um, and they were very wide ranging, which is fabulous. And I guess we really focused on improving the information that was available through the dashboard during disaster situations um, and making sure that um, there was better information available to the community more generally and including information that re um, prevented people accessing the beach in some cases and things like that. Uh, other things that we looked at was improving the construction of the pontoons as well and the attachments and things like that, and make, making sure that there was m more effort putting into preventing the, um, the polystyrene in the first place. Uh, the other big thing was actually working with the community a lot better to, to facilitate the clean-up and to progress that clean-up. And we've already started to speak to um, Sunshine Coast Council. They've got a fantastic community um, clean-up program that we're looking at. Um, they've also invited us to the clean up the hatchlings event in February to actually host our own 
events in Noosa um, and we've got like, a, quite a lot of community interested in that and we're just exploring those options. We're not telling the community what to do, we're actually offering to support existing efforts pretty much um, and providing them a lot more support. So yeah, that's, it's, it's, yeah, I feel that it was a really positive event and going forward we're already starting to implement quite a few of the things, quite a few of the items. Yeah. Yeah, it was a fantastic morning. Yeah, it really mm. was. And it was you know, I've had quite a few conversations since then and um, that positivity seems to be going forward. It was a really good example of what you want to achieve at of the round table process. You know, you had not only did you have the really well informed locals, you know, some some of the, the volunteers who were linked to international committees looking at the topic. Mm. Uh, but you also had three different shires because it was a regional problem. And you also had the state. Uh, there, as well as um, someone from the Polystyne industry, so you had that whole systems perspective of both the problem and how it might be solved and how it might be, you know, what the emergency response was there. A uh, nice morning and very constructive critiques and um, suggestions. So well done. Yeah. Oh, good to care. Mm, yes. Um, yeah, thank you for your report, Melissa. I think it was really good. Um, just moving on from your conversation about the community input as well. So yeah. I think it's really good that it provided such a great opportunity to demonstrate the influence of citizen leadership. Moving forward, how um, are you proposing to engage further with the community groups that were represented? Um, we're looking at that Clean Up the Hatchlings event to be basically a launch event for an ongoing community coastal cleanup program mm -hmm. and I've been speaking to a lot of people in the community on a casual basis because we're still working things out I'm still in the process of talking to Sunshine Coast Council to see how they do it and that kind of thing yeah. um, but my impression is that there's a lot of these community cleanups going on already mm -hmm. and I think that probably our, our community our sort of collaboration with them will be in a line of providing a bit of support, maybe providing a little bit of a framework, maybe seeing if there's any gaps or any double ups. And the other big issue is actually getting data about the kind of litter that we're getting on our beach because it can be quite different. I was really surprised mm. talking to some of these groups saying this is what we're getting and this is what we're getting and actually making sure that we've got that data that goes up into the larger programs. Um, so I guess Really, we're talking to the community groups as partners mm -hmm. um, and basically looking at ways that we can facilitate pretty much what they're already doing, mm. but give a bit more structure to it perhaps and give a, a, quite a bit more council support. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hi, Melissa. I would like for you to consider and maybe coming back to the general meeting um, with maybe um, recommendations to include a action plan or whether we could bring forward a report back to council with an action plan which identifies all those um, recommendations and the community input that's been listed on page 61 of the report. Um, there's just the, uh, this, this polystyrene meeting came about out of community frustration yeah. um, and I think it, in res just to respect the valuable input and feedback, um, it would be great to have um, just a report with an implementation plan, just identifying all those great um, recommendations and with uh, maybe a date, you know, within 12 months, yep. um, that this is what council endeavours to achieve. Um, but, but I just think this is a noting report. It would be great to be backed with also some type of report that identifies key recommendations that we can act upon within the next 12 months. Yep. Um, we need to continue the conversation um, and we need to um, value the community input by um, feeding it into a plan. Yep. Thank you, Melissa, and I'll talk to you later about it. No worries. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. I, I suppose just in response to Councillor Lawrence's suggestion, great suggestion, 
I'd probably just a little word of caution in terms of I think it'd be good to have a, have a come up with a draft action plan. A draft. That might be something that you took back to a second round table perhaps or to the agencies that are around that mm. table and the, and the parties. Mm. Only from the perspective of there are different agencies responsible for different actions mm. Mm. and also comes at a cost and a finan- comes at a financial and a, a resource side of things. So mm. there might be some actions that you identify or that have been identified that might be achieved through existing programs, mm-hmm. might be able to dovetail, or there might be some new initiatives also that we need to then probably put through the budgetary del- deliberation as part of the you know Ford, year, uh, Ford budget and planning, mm-hmm. but, but great suggestions. So I think I think probably worth putting a draft action plan together and maybe bringing it back maybe to the council to go through and then maybe you, you take it back to a, a second round table mm-hmm. perhaps. Great recommendation. Yeah. I think on a council perspective, though, we can sort of narrow it to what sure. we yeah. can do. Yep. So mm. I um, respect what you just said, yep. Leo, um, but there's some low hanging stuff that we can address almost immediately. Yep. Um, it'd be great, again, just to give, to give some confidence to the community that we not just listen to them, but we're also going to be acting. Um, and look, some of those things are already happening. Some things are probably already happening, and Fantastic. you've got mm. some of the volunteer groups that are probably already out there. And if we're working with them, great. But yeah. Oh, great. And on that, I know we might be the best person to ask this. I know Melissa was talking about the disaster dashboard and putting information up there. That's something that um, Larry, that James, yes. yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, so that's yeah, that's that's cross. That's yeah. Yeah. We've already been yeah. speaking to James yeah. about right. finding some opportunities. And I guess the other thing that we're really exploring is um, incorporating environmental protection into emergency response a little bit yeah. better, like recognising yeah. that it's mm. primarily driven by light and limb, but you know, with our cleanups, that we better yeah. address the environmental protection. And you've got your the camera, yeah. 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 that's what it is. And Melissa, one last question. Will the people that attended the meeting, will they be given a copy of this report? Oh, yes. Fantastic. Yep. Well, this, yeah, this is about public knowledge. Yeah. Um, sorry, through you, Chair. I think what we need to do then is, is given the workloads as well, is to, to, to say, let's yeah. bring, a, bring a, 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 um, an action plan back to, to Council is a, is, a, is a pretty big project. To be honest, because as, as Leo said, there's a whole lot of groups that need to be involved or considered anyway, costs and things like that. So I think it's more about my suggestion would be we come back as a workshop. We take this. This is a this is a report for noting as a report of the round table, which just brings everything back and says this is what we've captured. So it's basically minutes, and that's terrific. Mm. It's a big piece of work in itself. Mm. I think the next piece is a workshop to consider all of these because we need to consider them as council as well before we even start to. Start to broaden it, start to ask other groups. We need to have our resources from our end as well as the mm-hmm. So I think a workshop, yeah. and then we bring it back to council for some level of recommendation, and then we bring it around, you know, maybe either or, but bring it back to the round table, bring it back to those groups. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca? Yeah, I was just going to make a few comments. So <coughs> we purposely developed up the minutes so we could share with the participants um, all that was discussed to give them a sense of the actions going forward. We'll be using the minutes as a way of being able to tick off on, um, on what we can do um, in terms of engaging with Maritime Safety Queensland and um, Department of Environmental <coughs> Science on standards for logetics and for planning processes mm. um, uh, to be able to look at ways of um, coordinating volunteer efforts around cleanup, as Melissa said, um, where we can provide extra resources. There's a lot of things that we're doing underway at the moment that are documented in the minutes and we want to use that um, to keep ticking off progress as we go. Um, It's going to take time for a lot of the things that require advocacy with the state, Mm. Um, but um, we want to make sure that we're there at the table where we can to be able to share with them the experiences that we've had through this disaster. Um, coming out of the process, we will develop up a, a case study report. Um, Melissa was talking about avenues to make sure it's there, available at the ready. If someone was to do an internet search that was in a similar disaster that we were in, it would come to the top of the search engine and provide them with a resource so that the lessons we've learned, um, they, they, can, they, they can learn and, and use for their processes. 
Um, yeah, the, part of the process is developing up um, a video uh, on, on the polystyrene disaster to show, um, you know, the challenges that we had, uh, what it provided in terms of bringing volunteer effort together and um, how we can use that to develop some opportunities for, for future cleanups. So I think there is that documentation process and um, to be able to bring to you the progress we've made on that in probably six months time, I think would be really valuable and then to see what's left from that, um, what, what we can then pursue. Thanks. I just have a, a question then. Um, we've got a La Nina spring predicted. If we have another big flood event in that time, will our processes have changed in terms of how we respond to jetties washing up on the beach or are we still based on the same constraints? Yes, so well, in our emergency replaced. management meeting we talked about this um, with council staff about um, what process improvements we could make in the future. Um, but we'll always be challenged by resources, how many staff members are on the ground out there during the disaster that can respond and when we have a, a flood situation we have staff up in the hinterland and then they're dealing with um, responses on the coast as well. Um, but I, I think what this disaster highlighted was that we have a lot of interest from the community to be involved. There's just the, the important part of being able to have a coordinating mechanism for that. And there's, there's a real willingness there that um, where we're constrained by resources during these disasters, we have many that can come in and provide assistance with that. So that's the bit that we're trying to work through at the moment. So we, we can have better communication with these groups as a result of the support. We'll learn communication is key. And we can perhaps provide them with um, some sort of resource, like mm. bags or whatever, and have, it, have them provide quick more. more <coughs> yeah, yeah, to provide some manpower where it's safe for them to be able to, to help out mm. even yeah. post disaster. The other thing that we're doing is actually working with infrastructure services to identify beach accesses that we can use um, for emergency access. One of our big constraints was actually just getting onto the beach. Um, so we're already starting to yeah. talk to design and with and um, infrastructure services about finding and and modifying those beach accesses where we need to. And also, also, I guess the relationship with Sunshine Coast Council too, and, and that collaboration because we all mm. share those features, you know, mm. yeah. 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 So yeah. and yeah. resources and things like that. You know, floods don't discriminate. So, mm. and, and Larry with the disaster management, James and the dashboard. I think they're all things that we can we can actually pretty quickly, can't we? Yeah. Get a web -based and that's what we're doing. Yeah, so there's a better communication tool now. Yeah. yeah. But there's so many lessons learned. Just just mm. anecdotally, just in, in the type of machinery you have. How big it yeah. needs to be, mm. how to do it, how quickly we need to react because mm. you know, this this was all green on the fly. Absolutely. Yeah. Very yeah. much so. No, so no, yeah, we've, we've now got yeah. a, lot, no. a lot more of that, that lesson that we can now look at what needs to be prioritised and when. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, you know, it's already it's already there, the fact that it's documented here. Yeah. But then an action plan documentation is, is next phase, but it's a matter of, you know, that's a process we need to we need to follow. And we just can't overload people. Yeah, sure. yeah, and also on that, Larry, now we have those point, those key people in the community who we know we can call on That's to. That's right, exactly. We so can make things a lot easier, all that easy. communication. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah we're still yeah. really developing that relationship, which yeah. I think is going to be really cool. Because yeah, yeah. we probably won't get another polystyrene event, but we will get another marine debris Absolutely. event. Yes. Yeah. That's right. I think through the event, we recognise the inherent value of our community and the expertise that they bring to the table. Yeah. So I think Absolutely. moving forward, these collaborations, certainly this is something we can bring through when we're doing our corporate plan and, you know, bringing in more and more disaster management into our everyday operations and engaging with our community for, you know, the outcomes that we're, we're all seeking in response to yep. climate change and all that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, thank you. It's and great to And Karen, their willingness to be involved. Oh, absolutely. Like, you know, they were so great. They just yeah. stood up. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. Thank well, you. once again, we add, we're all in a ferocious agreement here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's a, there's a two-way street between what council can do and what community can do. Mm -hmm. And um, we, and this, 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 this roundtable and the whole event has helped us understand how mm -hmm. we can work together and um, respect and, and give the autonomy to our community to act mm -hmm. and where the boundaries are, what we can do. So. Yeah. Uh, going forward, obviously, it appears that we're going to have plenty more emergency 
like this, whether it's inland, fighter, we, we're in for it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think this is a really great summary, so I look forward to uh, as we find out a further report. Do we need to motion that now, or should, or can we just leave the... No, I think just, the, the, for me, it's just noting this report. Yeah. The, the workshop is something that we can do as, a, as an operational exercise. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we, we don't need, probably don't need to move this to a uh, general duty. No, no. No. Really no. Say, no. no. Okay. Uh, and we've noted that uh, Councillor Stoff has yeah. left the room. Yes. Yeah. I'm, happy I'm, move this. I'm happy to second. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. 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 Thank you.